Well, we're in Marin County, um, and about 20 years ago, this was one of the epicenter of an, a new and unexplainable large-scale mortality of oaks and of a related species of oaks called tan oaks. And for many years, it, it was extremely um, disturbing because we couldn't really figure out what was going on. The patterns of mortality didn't match any known disease. And so I actually started, um, I'd just been hired at Berkeley and I started trying to understand who the culprit was. And together with uh, Professor Rizzo uh, at UC Davis, we were actually able to put the pieces together. When we tried to, to describe the microbe morphologically, we found out that uh, in all likelihood, it had never been described before. In fact, the, the pathogen was new to science. And obviously that made the whole disease scarier from one point of view um, because there was no prior knowledge we could use to control it. The huge amount of genetic information provided by the genome sequencing at um, the Joint Genome Institute was instrumental in providing the necessary evidence that this terrible disease really had been introduced by the ornamental industry. The pathogen that causes SOD is called Phytophthora ramorum. Phytophthora in Greek means plant destroyer, and that gives an idea of how aggressive um, and, and lethal these pathogens can be, both in forests and in agricultural systems. So this is coastal live oak, which is one of the most iconic trees in California landscapes. It is an extremely drought tolerant tree. And for that reason, it, it, it has played a pivotal role in the resilience of, of our uh, coastal ecosystems all the way from Baja California to Northern California. And unfortunately, it's one of the victims of sudden or death, this uh, lethal, terrible disease that uh, uh, became emergent in the, the mid-1990s, but was probably introduced about 20 years earlier or 15 years earlier. So what you see behind me are the standing dead. In this very spot, we can see the four stages of progression of the disease. To my right, there's a small tan oak, which appears to be still relatively healthy, so we assume it's still uninfected. Right behind me, there's a tree with bleeding cankers, but the canopy is still green. We don't expect this tree to be alive. It's dead and he doesn't know it. Behind us, there's a tree with the entire canopy browned, that is why we call it sudden oak death, because the entire canopy goes brown all at once. That means that that tree has died within the last few months. And around the tree uh, that died a few months uh, ago, there are several skeleton trees. These are trees that have dropped their leaves. We normally estimate these trees have died one to three years ago. And what's going to happen next is these trees are going to fall down because of the decay agents. They become very, very active in trees that are killed by Phytophthora ramorum. What, what do we see here are the typical bleeding cankers that are associated with infection by the sudden or death pathogen. The pathogen is actually under the bark, so we can't see the lesions caused by the pathogen under the bark. But the tree responds by producing a liquid that seeps out on top of the bark. So this is the clear indication that something is happening under the bark. And in order to understand what's happening, we need to cut off the bark. There are two other things that are interesting on this tree. One is the abundance of moss. And there are some people and some studies that have shown that tendentially when you have a lot of moss on the trunk, uh, there seems to be more infection. And we think because the moss actually increases the relative humidity at the bark level and allows for the spores to survive longer. And the other interesting thing of this tree is the abundant presence of sawdust. We call it frass. And this is very fine sawdust generated by boring beetles. We have bark beetles and ambrosia beetles. 
they will preferentially or almost exclusively attack trees that are very severely compromised. So sudden of death is actually the reason why the tree is compromised and the beetles act as secondary agents. Nonetheless, the beetles will speed up the death of the plant. So the plant will die faster because it's being attacked by bark beetles. But in the absence of sudden of death or other primary diseases, these beetles would not be attracted to this plant. I can tell you that the results of that genome exercise were incredibly useful to people like me who are field researchers. So we are in the field trying to understand how the disease moves, what is the epidemiology in a forest. And studying forest disease epidemiology is very complicated. Uh, how can we slow it down? How can we detect it? How can we stop it? Um, and how, you know, what is the full epidemiological cycle? So how do, does soil, does water contribute to the spread of the disease, disease? These were all questions that we were asking. And thanks to, to the sequence provided, to the DNA information provided by the genome, we were able to answer some of these questions. But more importantly, once, once we had the sequences, we were able to actually develop a DNA-based assay and this DNA-based assay became the first DNA-based assay ever used in a country in the world to regulate um, or to diagnose a regulated pathogens. This was a big deal because we had our suspicion that the organism had been introduced in California through infected ornamental plants, not forest plants. These are plants that were actually used in gardens. And so um, it was important to have a better, more robust assay to identify any potential uh, carrier of, of this terrible disease. An additional benefit of having the genome information provided by the Joint Genome Institute for Phytophthora romorum was that of being able early on to identify different variants. And these different variants actually behave differently. And uh, as a result, one of the fears is to have multiple of these variants in our forest because together the effect is synergistic, meaning that if you have multiple variants, the effect is not just the sum of them, uh, it's more than the sum of them. So together they can actually cause much worse devastation in a forest. One of the reasons why we were able to use the genome of Phytophthora romorum was because Another Phytophthora, which just causes a serial problem in soybeans, was sequenced um, simultaneously. So the two sequences were, were, were done together, and there was a lot more information about the other Phytophthora called Phytophthora soji. And so we were able to reconstruct the genome by having this other Phytophthora being sequenced uh, uh, at the same time. And uh, we were also able to provide very interesting comparative analysis on the evolution of Phytophthora in general. Phytophthora is incredibly important in agriculture. In fact, the, the most famous Phytophthora of them all is probably Phytophthora infestans, the uh, organism responsible for the great potato famine in the 1800s in Ireland, which led to the migratory flux uh, from Ireland into the United States. The availability of Two genomes all at once, um, sequenced at, at the Joint Genome Institute, allowed us to do comparative analysis and understand how these two pathogens have evolved uh, to be very aggressive and how they interact with hosts. The results of the comparative analysis of the genomes of these two important Phytophthora species were published in 2006 in a highly cited paper in the Journal of Science. When it rains, Phytophthora romorum is very successful and we see a lot of new infection. But when it's dry, Phytophthora romorum doesn't do so well. So we actually have decreasing level of infection with decreasing rainfall. Unfortunately, the bad news is that because of climate change, uh, these droughts are having a much greater effect than previous droughts. So it's not just drier, it's also warmer and there is less fog. So they really changes the, the ecosystem quite dramatically. And recently we've seen a very steep increase in tree mortality caused by tree pathogens, 
that are already inside the tree, so they're part of the tree microbiome, but they become aggressive and can kill the tree that actually hosts them um, when the tree suffers because of extreme drought. And we call these, I call these organisms Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde organisms because they are originally beneficial organisms and then um, when the environment triggers them, they become extremely aggressive. So our forests are facing now two challenges. One is um, uh, given by invasive organisms, uh, Phytophthora ramorum is one of them, uh, and correlated organisms like bark beetles and these kind of organisms that are secondary. And the second challenge is by these microbiome endophytes that become aggressive pathogens. The predictions are that in the near future, the two uh, types of, of, of diseases will significantly change the range and the distribution of, of our native trees in California. The magnitude of the problem caused by endophytes is not understood yet because this is a new phenomenon. But we understand a little bit better the magnitude of the mortality caused by sudden of death. And it has been estimated recently that close to 200 million trees have been infected and over 60 million trees have been killed. So if, if you think about California, our population is what, 40 million or so? So this would be basically wiping out every single Californian that lives in the state. So this is a fairly major um, uh, impact um, on our ecosystems. And it has been shown that the presence of sudden of death induced mortality uh, for a certain period of time really increases the, fire for, uh, the risk for wildfires. So wildfires become a lot hotter and they behave much more erratically when you have oaks and tan oaks that have been killed by sudden of death. The sudden of death pathogen uh, is exotic to California. And for that reason, trees like the oak behind me uh, have never developed any kind of resistance against it um, due to the lack of coevolution. One of the things we can do through the injections is actually boost the immune system and make these oaks uh, more resistant. So we're injecting oak trees as a preventative measure for sudden oak death. This is a phosphorus compound, phosphite or phosphonate, which is injected into the tree and aids the tree in fighting the infection. So then what we're going to do here is we're going to drill a, uh, a hole in the tree, not particularly deep. We're just going to go underneath the bark and into the living tissue of the tree. What we're trying to do, of course, is to create a pocket where you can, uh, where you can pressurize to put the chemicals in. You'll notice that the, the bark there, the bark shavings are sort of a dark red like that. And now you notice how they start to turn white. That's where we're getting into the actual heartwood of the tree. So then you take the injector and you insert it like this, a couple of twists. It has a screw thread on its end like so. Screw it in tight and then release the pressure. And that will then push the chemical into the tree. The injection boosts the immune system and the response of the tree to infection making it more resilient and more capable of actually fighting off the pathogen as it's trying to kill it. We've been really interested in understanding why are trees more resistant after injection. And that's one of the applications of the genome that was provided by the Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute. The organism was sequenced really early on when it was discovered. And the, we've used that sequence uh, to understand how the pathogen responds in a plant that's being treated with the phosphate. And the result was very interesting because we were able to show that uh, the, the plant treated actually becomes basically a resistant plant. And how do we do that? We did that by comparing the response of plants that are somewhat resistant to plants that are not resistant but have been treated with a chemical. And all of the genes that are normally well expressed in resistant individuals were well expressed um, in, in individuals that were injected with phosphites. One of the tools that we can use to fight the disease 
but we consider this a, a secondary tool because even if the immune system is boosted and trees are more resistant, they're not fully resistant. So basically they're actually more tolerant, but eventually they will die. So one of the um, better approaches to control the disease is that of changing the epidemiology by, of the disease by removing the infectious host. And this is kind of a surprise, but the sudden or death pathogen is actually not transmitted by oaks. So oaks are dead end hosts, but it's transmitted by other trees that grow in the forest together with oaks. And the most important one is California bay laurel, a very common tree on the coast of California made even more common by fire exclusion. So these trees, the tree species, very common, very abundant, and unfortunately, the leaves of bay laurels are incredibly infectious. So this bay laurel is within uh, a few feet from the oak that we were talking about or standing in front of earlier on. And um, it displays the typical symptoms of sudden oak death. So what you see here is um, the necrotic lesion, so it's a dead portion of the lesion, normally where water accumulates, and it's clearly visible. Of course, the tree really doesn't even know it's infected because the lesions are fairly minimal. However, these dark lesions here produce a very, very large number of propagules that then become airborne. And when a large number of these propagules end up on the bark of an oak, then that oak can potentially become infected. One of the best ways to actually control sudden of death is to remove bay laurels that are um, growing uh, near oak trees, or even just to reduce the density of bay laurel in, in a stand. And as we're doing this, we're actually helping nature to go back to its normal state. So we are bringing the forest back to what its natural composition is. So what, when we talk about bay removal to control sudden of death, we actually talk about reducing the density, bringing the forest back to a healthier uh, amount of biomass and also reducing fuels. So it's, it's kind of a win-win situation. And uh, by no means do we, do we mean or do we intend to remove all bay laurels because of course they also play a very important role in the ecosystem. By reducing fuels, we also reduce the chance of extremely hot wildfires. And we also reduce the chances of infection because trees are more spaced out. And so there is more social distancing and uh, infectious diseases respond very well to social distancing. As we increase the distance among trees, we decrease the chances of sudden or death to move from one tree to the next. how the disease moves, what is the epidemiology in a forest. And studying forest disease epidemiology is very complicated. Uh, how can we slow it down? How can we detect it? How can we stop it? How far does the pathogen move? So one big concern was because the, the pathogen is aerial, uh, could it move tens of miles maybe, which, which would mean that the entire state of California could be covered in a very short time. And so what we do, we actually look for the presence of genetic markers uh, away from a source. And so one day, we, um, after we realized that that was essential, we figured out that no matter how much money we had in grants, we would, didn't have the means to do this fine scale analysis of the presence of the disease over the several hundred of miles already infested by sudden of death. And so the idea came up um, walking with two volunteers that were helping me on another project of, hey, we can help you actually detect and, and survey for the disease at a very fine scale because we love going around our neighborhood. And if you teach us how to do it, then we can do it for you. The program is called the sudden oak death blitzes uh, because we like people to go in the forest more or less everybody goes at the same time and they sample intensively uh, an area during a weekend so that we know that all the samples uh, were collected in the same condition. My name is Leah Green. I'm currently a student at Berkeley City College and I'm part of a program that allows students to work at the UC Berkeley Forest Pathology Lab. 
Uh, one of the things that we do is the Sod Blitz project, and I have been participating in it for two years. My name is Natalie Chapman. I'm a biological lab sciences student at Berkeley City College. Um, I'd like to know more about the sample collection process. And my motivation for getting involved is that uh, sudden oak death is a really serious problem in California and it needs addressing. These are a good example of symptomatic bay leaves. They have brown tips and a yellow halo around them. Oh, they'll be good for sampling. Now I'm going to use the Sod Map mobile app to get the coordinates of our location. You turn on the app and the app will show you in a graphic format all of the trees that are infected in your neighborhood. But it will also calculate how likely it is that your oak will become infected. Because we actually wanted uh, people to collect samples and we wanted to test every single sample that was collected in the lab. We're at the University of California at Berkeley in the Forest Pathology and Mycology Laboratory processing our field samples that we took for sudden oak death. What our students here are doing is they are going through the samples that have been collected by um, people in their own communities up and down the state of California and punching out a small portion of the leaf that we believe may be infected with Phytophthora romorum, the causal agent of sudden oak death. These are mostly California bay laurel leaves, which are a vector for the sudden oak death pathogen. And our student researchers are sampling these leaves in a very systematic way so that we can then extract the DNA from these samples and test genetically for the presence of the sudden oak death pathogen. About April through July, we get the samples processed, and then we do the genetic analysis in July and August, and we usually have the results ready at the end of October and the beginning of November. So it's quite a long process, and involves hundreds of person hours uh, of direct laboratory work to do this. And of course, we do it for free. Without their help, we would never be able to sample so extensively and so completely from year to year. Ultimately, the goal of this project is to provide better information for people who are studying the spread of sudden oak death and to give the people of the state of California better information which will help them understand and hopefully in the future mitigate the spread of sudden oak death. After we've generated the leaf punches, we put them on growth media and if the pathogen is present, it's gonna grow in the media. And then we extract its DNA, run PCR on it, and then we sequence its DNA. And by looking at the gene sequences, we can tell if it's the pathogen that we're looking for. After we've extracted the DNA, I can now run a PCR on it, which will amplify the DNA of the pathogen that we're looking for, which is Phytophthora morum that's responsible for sudden oak death. The real-time PCR machine amplifies the specific DNA sequence associated with Phytophthora morum. These samples right here in the display, these are positive samples that we added to the experiment as a control. A negative control would be a line right here on the bottom, you can't see that one. But these samples right here, these are samples that were collected in the field, sent in for analysis, and these are positive for sudden oak death. The results of the Sodblitz survey project are available to the public in the fall of each year on sodblitz.org. And so this was the first example of, in the world, of a large-scale citizen science project that actually contributed real data that has been used in modeling and prediction of spread of the disease in a way that's, that's never been done before. We also like to call it community science because the project is not done at the individual level. So people don't just go online and you know, download the information. They actually gather in local communities and they do the search together. And often once the results come in, they join forces to do the treatment. We have 30 such community science um, activities throughout the state, 
and people really like going back to, to their group every year to find out what's new, uh, what new developments there are about sudden or death, are there any new treatments? So really, uh, we look at this as a grassroots activity and Berkeley basically coordinates the whole activity, but each community is responsible for rallying up the troops, for sending out the messages, for also sharing the new information. And surprisingly, we, are, we were the first citizen science project where data are published in real time on the web. One year, but this, I could repeat it for multiple years, but one year the statistics were very clear. We had 500 people who collected samples and the data were um, used by 3 million people. So huge, I mean, this is exactly how you can augment the impact of what you're doing by working with the community. So there is that impact that rather than just a scientific publication, uh, the public hears about this project where data are generated by the public and it really entices them to look at the data because it's, it's significant for them. Um, it, will, it will make a difference between death or life for their trees. Mm -hmm.